Hello, welcome to New Scientist Weekly. This is the podcast where we select the best and most intriguing of the week's science stories. I'm Rowan Hooper. I'm back from the wilderness. Rowan Hooper, it is great to have you back. I'm Timothy Revel. This week, we're marking the passing of physics legend Peter Higgs. We're saving the white rhino. We're discussing a new way to hunt for extraterrestrial life. And we'll hear about the discovery of a rare event in evolutionary history. All that, and we're going to hear music made by mushrooms, or more correctly, by the mycorrhizal network, the fungal network underground. But let's start with a trip to the multiverse. Uh, maybe we're already in the multiverse and it's even bigger than we thought. Carmela Padovich Callahan is here to explain, which I'm very glad about. Let's start with a recap about the concept of the multiverse, the, the meta collection of universes. Right. So we have to go back to 1957 uh, when physicist Hugh Everett came up with his own interpretation of quantum mechanics, which then spawned this idea of many worlds. One of the key ideas in quantum physics is that every object can be described by a mathematical function called the wave function. And this is sort of where the trouble starts. <laughs> the wave function describes every possible state of that object. So if you think about me as a quantum object, you would have to write down my wave function to learn anything about me, but that wave function would have to contain all possible versions of me. So like the regular me, the regular Carmela, but also a Carmela who chose to come to work in clown makeup today, and also a Carmela who didn't come to work at all. Funnily enough, I do think of you as a quantum function. So, <laughs> I mean, can, I'm a can little... you go away and put some clown makeup on and then come right, back just to, right. just to mess with our minds? That would uh, that's yeah. that's what I'm gonna do after lunch. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, you know, if I were, you know, I'm I'm too big and I'm too warm to be truly quantum. But if I was a quantum object, you would have to think about me that way. And the only way you would have to figure out which of these options are true would be to interact with me. So you'd probably have to call me on the phone and be like, are you wearing clown makeup right now? And that would effectively collapse my wave function. And this okay. idea of a wave function collapse is something the physicists were bothered by from the very inception of quantum theory. And Everett's idea was to basically say it shouldn't happen at all. Instead, he argued that every state in the wave function is absolutely real, just in another universe. So according to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which Everett came up with, the versions of me that we were just joking about all exist just yeah. in universes that I can't access. So, you know, there is a copy of me in another universe who's not at work right now at all, and it's just chilling at home. I just can't see them. We'll come back to this concept later because it's really taken off in the popular imagination. But tell us about the story that you've reported on this week, because the idea of that is that they're not just not just the many worlds that Everett <laughs> proposed, but there are many more worlds than that in the multiverse. So what is going on? Yeah, I mean, so actually, the researchers that I spoke to started with an exactly opposite point than my example. So they said, what if we wanted to th still think about wave function collapse and, you know, how you go from a, a qu like a fuzzy quantum state of many possibilities to just one definitive measurable thing, but we need to take out any sort of reference to a human observer or any kind of other special observer. So in other words, the split into many worlds could arise in in any different ways or even if we're not there. Yeah, exactly, right? So so a good way to think about this is to think about the early universe where presumably quantum things were happening but no one was around to see them. In a situation like that, why would there be a special observer? So the researchers started with exactly this. They didn't designate any observer. They just said, okay, what if you have a quantum system and it's got some energy structure so you know what the objects in that system could do with that energy? And then you ask yourself the question of how many different ways are there to divide this system into subsystems, which will then sort of interact and talk to each other, and through those interactions give rise to a classical world. And when I say classical, I really mean this sort of like getting rid of possibilities, like you calling me on the phone and, and saying, like, are you wearing clown makeup right now? Yeah. <laughs> but 
you know, without having that sort of like nice picture and just doing this like very mathematical, like how many ways are there to do this, they found that there are many more of these subsystem divisions than they really expected. So there were more ways to give rise to the many worlds of Everett. And really, there's many more worlds than Everett thought about. It's getting completely out of control, isn't it? (laughs) I feel like I'm just about getting my head around this. So in this situation, there are many more ways to give rise to a split in the universe leading to these many more worlds. What can we actually say about them? All these new worlds, the many in many more, would they be very different than the worlds that presumably arise when we make decisions in our own world? Like, What, do, what can we say? Right. This is another tricky question, but from the mathematics, just sort of, you know, a pen and paper on the page, they absolutely look quite different than what we are used to. So the splits that you would get between these subsystems wouldn't be intuitive at all. So it could be, you know... um, the Andromeda galaxy exerting some faraway influence like on your left shoe or something. It wouldn't necessarily be anything that you would guess in the way you'd guess you can call me on the phone. So the human perspective really wouldn't matter. At the same time, sort of infuriatingly, when I asked the researchers whether they think these worlds are actually real, these many more, they told me they were ontologically agnostic. They've done some computations, sort of came up with an algorithm for these splits, and they feel very good about the algorithm. But interpreting what's actually going on here is incredibly difficult. As one team member told me, if you are feeling skeptical, you could say that this is a little bit like cloud watching. You can see shapes, but do they actually matter? I feel like ontologically and agnostic is such a physicist I'm response. Gonna use that. I'm going to try and <laughs> yeah. use that. Yeah. Just use that whenever you, you want get to get out of jail free card. This reminds me of when I was reporting on this a while ago on belief in the multiverse. And uh, I sought out some scientists who really did believe it. So they weren't ontologically agnostic. They (laughs) believed in this stuff. Mm. I spoke to Max Tegmark, the physicist, and he told me that he believed in these multiverse maxes. And he said they were closer to him than brothers in in the real, in our world, you know. And he, he actually thought about himself in the multiverse. But according to the people you spoke to, we can imagine these multiverse versions of ourselves if we want, just as we harmlessly see a shape in the clouds, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the really amazing things about this story. It invites so many questions beyond just how the mathematics work. You know, I've I've talked to some folks about this algorithm and the calculations and, you know, the details of that. But really, when it comes down to it, even Everett's sort of most vanilla many worlds interpretation has been around for almost 60 years. We've not really found any smoking gun experimental evidence. And yet it's heavily championed by folks like Tegmark and, and other physicists who will tell you that, you know, the way we solve quantum gravity is to go to the many worlds interpretation. So this new idea, I think leaves room for the same kind of imagination, and it also leaves room for further work. There's more calculations that the researchers could do, and they even have some idea about testing it on cosmological scales, sort of with radiation from the Big Bang that's still in our sky. So I really want to say that this is outlandish, but all these copies of us, there's probably some small chance that they are actually out there. (laughs) Love it. Look, we'll put a link to your story on this in the show notes because uh, people really need to check out the, the, the details of this. But look, just to come back to the cultural impact of the multiverse, mm. it seems to really have taken off in the last decade or so, doesn't it? You see it everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's such a staple of science fiction. And I think it will never not be interesting for people to entertain this idea that there are alternate versions of themselves out there. Personally, I've, I've always thought that this idea is kind of encouraging. You know, quantum mechanics is the most correct theory of physics that we think we have. And it doesn't forbid you from straddling many worlds at once. So why would you in your like regular single world that you experience limit yourself to only being one type of person? Yeah. I mean, I recently I, I really loved the Spider-Verse uh, yeah. interpretation, like all the different versions of that. I thought that was a brilliant way of doing it. I mean, I liked Alex Garland's devs as well. That I thought that was a really rich mm, way of going. Yeah. Tim, have you got any uh, favorite multiverse? Yeah, I think it's hard to beat everything everywhere all at hey. once. That oh was my God, yes. so good. Yeah, and yeah. I just love the idea that somewhere, you know, in this universe, I'm a podcast host, but somewhere <laughs> else, I'm this incredible martial arts fighter staring at a giant everything bagel. You're not hot dog, or you Tim? Might have- 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or you might have wobbly arms. Yeah, I know. might have wobbly arms. <laughs> That's not one I dream of, but, you know, who knows? Now we have a hopeful story about an animal on the brink of extinction, the northern white rhino. Corinne Wetzel joins us from New York to talk all about it. Hi, Corinne. Hi. So this is a pretty rare instance for this animal of good news, right? Yeah, I'm happy to say it is. So northern white rhinos are one of the most iconic endangered species on Earth, and that's because there's two of them left in the entire subspecies. Um, And it's a mother and a daughter, and unfortunately, both of them are infertile. So that has made it really tricky to try and save this subspecies from total extinction. Um, Yeah, that does sound like a bit of a problem. So if neither of these rhinos can have offspring, what's the next approach? What can we do? Well, luckily, we have some rhino genes on ice. So San Diego Zoo has a frozen repository of a bunch of different animal cells from all different species. And in that collection, they have skin cells from 12 northern white rhinos that have since died. And they were curious if that offered enough genetic diversity to build back the rhino population without them being catastrophically inbred. I see, right. Because if they were inbred, they'd be less likely to survive disease and maybe all of this effort would ultimately lead to their extinction anyway. Right. Yeah. Generally, being inbred is is sort of a bummer for survival. So so first, they looked at all this genetic material in those samples to see how similar and different they were from each other. And then they put that all into a computer model that basically ran the simulation of what it would be like if those rhinos were able to breed and recover and and build back the population over 10 generations. And the answer was that they can, right? Just 12 rhinos is enough, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, so the genetic diversity in those 12 frozen samples was enough to build back uh, the entire subspecies based on their findings. So northern white rhinos wouldn't be inbred at all, which is a pretty remarkable finding. All this is great, but um, before we pat ourselves on the back, how are we going to turn these skin cells? What, do we clone them? Is that how you make them into a rhino? What's the What's the idea? Yeah, so there's still quite a few leaps that uh, need to be made to to (laughs) save the species. Um, So one method is cloning. They could clone these skin cells, turn them into, you know, living, breathing rhinos that could potentially breed with each other. But another process that they're looking at is actually taking these skin cells, reverting them to uh, stem cells, and then they can chemically coax them into egg and sperm, which can be combined to create embryos. And they've actually already managed to create northern white rhino embryos with collected eggs and sperm. So So this isn't such a far-fetched idea. Right. So there's already embryos of rhinos out there. That's that's cool. And what? So the idea would be, because I'm thinking of when when we talk about the proposal to breed mammoths, they talk about getting the the mammoth embryos and putting them into an elephant. So we would get these uh, rhino embryos and put them into related rhino mums, right? Exactly. So um, there is a closely related subspecies called the southern white rhino, and they're much less endangered. There's about 20,000 of them versus two of these guys. Mm. Um, So they would make – scientists are hoping they'd make really excellent surrogates because, you know, they're similar biologically. um, And hopefully they would be able to carry a pregnancy and then give birth to a northern white rhino. So Mm. um, that's that's ultimately the goal. And I guess – I think it was two years ago now our colleague Carissa wrote about how um, they did succeed successfully create an embryo and put it into a southern white rhino who did get pregnant, um, which was a a great first step. She did end up passing away later from unrelated causes. So unfortunately, there was no baby rhino that came out of that, but um, a really good proof of concept. Okay, look, I mean, it's a great good news story on one hand, but it does make me feel a bit melancholy because, Mm -hmm. you know, you just wish we could preserve the things in the first place, right, and (laughs) protect them. They're such extraordinary animals. When I I remember seeing them in the wild. And you feel this really strange mix of emotions. They're so magnificent, but you feel somehow they they carry sadness around with them as well. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, There's no question that it is far easier and cheaper to prevent animals from reaching the brink of extinction where we have to come in with all these fancy scientific interventions. Mm. But in the case of climate change, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, we caused it. It's on us to, to fix it yeah. a bit. Um, but in the case of these northern white rhinos, we really can't just let them be and see if they'll bounce back. We know that because the last two are infertile, that they would be sort of doomed. So yeah. um, we yeah, do yeah. need scientific intervention. Yeah. If this works out, do you think these animals will only exist in zoos or could we see wild versions of the species? 
I think it's everyone's long-term goal to see uh, wild, wild versions of these rhinos. But at least in the beginning, they'll probably have to be in protected areas, you know, zoos, things like that, because they're just too precious. They need full-time protection. But ultimately, long-term, if they're able to recover, sort of like the southern white rhino was able to, then there's no reason that they couldn't be out on the landscape if the habitat and protections exist for them. Let's take a break to let you know that season two of Dead Planet Society is coming on Tuesday. Woo! Yeah, this is the show where we give ourselves cosmic power to investigate fundamental questions in space-time. <laughs> and in the first episode, it doesn't get much more powerful than this. It's how to destroy a black hole. <laughs> Starting big and destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely love it. Love it. To celebrate the return of the show, we're offering a special deal on a digital subscription to New Scientist, which will include unlimited access to our website and app and unrivaled archive of material. The deal is 10 weeks for 10 British pounds or 10 US dollars. To claim, go to newscientist.com slash DPS offer. And we'll put that link in the show notes so you can just click on it. And of course, do look out for the new season of Dead Planet Society. It'll be in your feed on Tuesday. Now it's time for Life Form of the Week. And this week, it's a single-celled alga whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. But it's widespread in oceans all around the world. And Michael LePage is here to sing its praises. Michael, what is so special about this alga? Well, this week we learnt that this alga, it's called uh, Brurudosferi bigelowi. <laughs> I, I may well be much. pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that. Anyway, this alga has done something that we thought had happened only three times in the entire history of life on Earth. That's three and a half billion years. So this alga has formed such a close relationship with a bacterium living inside it that this bacterium has in effect become part of its cell. It's formed this new cellular structure or organelle. And what this organelle does is to fix nitrogen, that is to make nitrogen fertilizer for the algal cell. And that's the only organelle we know of that does this. And of course, this is probably why this alga is so widespread in the oceans and so successful. Wow. So when you say it's the only the fourth time we've known this has happened, but we know that you know many organisms have symbiotic bacteria inside them, don't they? It's endosymbiosis. So, what's... Yes, endosymbiosis is really common. But in almost all cases, endosymbionts remain as distinct organisms. So take, for instance, legume plants such as peas and beans. Right. Now, these can also make their own nitrogen fertilizer because they've got nitrogen-fixing bacteria inside their yeah. roots. But these bacteria, they're only found in specialized cells in the roots and the seedlings acquire them from the soil around them as, a, as they sort of sprout. They don't come as part of the plant cell. They're not part of the actual structure of the right. cell. And you can compare this to the chloroplasts that carry out photosynthesis in all the plants we know of. Now, these are a fundamental part of plant cells, and they can't survive outside of plant cells. But what we discovered is that they actually originally evolved from free-living bacteria, perhaps around a billion years ago. Yeah. So this is one of those three examples okay, I mentioned. Okay, okay, right. So something similar has happened in this algal cell, as you say, with a nitrogen fixing bacterium becoming a fundamental part of the cell and forming a new organelle. How come we've only just discovered it? It seems like something maybe we'd already know about. Yeah, well, it's actually been suspected for a while now because it's been known that this alga has this very close relationship with this nitrogen fixing, what they thought was a nitrogen fixing bacterium called eucin A. And we also knew that eucin A has lost some of the key genes it needs to survive independently. The trouble is that these algae, uh, when you take them out of the sea, they die pretty quickly, and that makes them really hard to study. Mm. And only recently have biologists developed ways of keeping them alive in, in the lab and watching them as they divide and grow. And what they saw is that these, these use in A, they divide at exactly the same time as the algal cells divide, and each new cell gets, gets one of them. And they also found that when you look at the proteins that are inside the use in A, half of them actually come from the algal cell. They're not made by the use in A itself. So those two findings confirm beyond any doubt that this is actually, it's part of the cell. It's a new cellular structure. It's no longer an independent thing. Wow, this is very cool stuff. You know, you mentioned legumes and pe like peas and um, beans and lentils. And I know that lots of scientists are trying to take the trick that legumes do to fix their own nitrogen and move it to things like cereals and wheat and things so they can make their own nitrogen. So would there be a way of getting these eucin A organelles that you've just been talking about, you know, putting them into cereal crops? 
Yeah, the, I mean, the idea of equipping crop plants with nitrogen-fixing organelles is definitely being explored and by some bio mm. biologists, and there's a lot of interest in that. The trouble with using A is that because it's so integrated with this algal cell, it's actually going to be very hard to take it out of that algal cell and stick mm. it in other things because it's not going to get these sort of proteins that it acquires um, from the algal cell. But we do know of other nitrogen-fixing endosymbionts that are not nerdy so far along with this process of becoming integrated with the host cell, and they're still largely independent. So these are actually better candidates for sort of taking and sticking in other things because what we want, the ideal is you could find uh, an organelle-like thing that you can stick into any plant without having to modify that plant a lot. Yeah. And if we could achieve this, it would be such a huge deal yeah. uh, because getting plants to fix their own nitrogen, it's not just about saving a bit of money for farmers in terms of fertilizers. It's also result in huge reductions in greenhouse gas emissions because making fertilizers is a major source of emissions. For our next segment, we're going alien hunting. Yeah, what I like about this story is that it's a way of searching for life on other planets that doesn't make doesn't mean we have to traipse all the way out <laughs> to the other planet. Yeah, they tend to be a bit too far away for that. Yeah, I mean, what frustrates me is I don't think interstellar travel is going to be invented while I'm alive. But luckily, there are great ways to look for signs of life elsewhere from here on Earth. And there's that famous example from James Lovelock, who uh, you know became famous for the Gaia hypothesis. Yeah. Um, but when he was working for NASA in the 70s, uh, he was attached to the, the Viking missions to Mars. And he was asked to look at the possibility of life on Mars. So he decided to look at the mm. atmosphere of Mars. And from that, he determined that it was a dead planet. And that was before they'd launched the, the mission, <laughs> which uh, really pissed off the people at NASA. Yeah, that always makes me laugh. A big part of the Viking missions were to explore for life. So they didn't really like being told that there was no life yeah. there. Okay, so usually if we're searching for extraterrestrial life, we tend to look for like specific signatures of life. These are called biosignatures or sometimes like abnormal patterns of light that may have been produced by technologies. And they're sometimes called techno signatures. But I'm Guessing what we've got this week is is something entirely different. Uh, it is, and I, I I do like the term techno signatures. I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, before. it's a good one. Yeah, so this is something different. So imagine if Elon Musk's proposal to colonize Mars, mm. if that actually works and goes ahead, um, and then in a few hundred years we have this big population of people on Mars, and then maybe in a thousand years after that we've even terraformed Mars, then from a distance Earth and Mars will look quite similar because we've now colonized two planets. So this idea is that aliens might well have done this as well. So if you look at similarities between groups of exoplanets, between planets in other solar systems, um, and you find these similarities, it, that might indicate the presence of life. Yeah, I guess that is a completely new way of thinking about it. You're yeah. not looking for anything in particular, like some sort of biosignature, like a particular molecule. Yeah. Instead, you're just looking for similarities. Yeah, so you're not tying yourself down with assumptions about what we think life is and what it does to a planet. That's the idea, yeah. and it's a nice idea. But is that it, or is there more to it? Yeah, they've done some modelling um, to see if it would work, and it works, uh, you know, statistically will work to, to pick out similarities. But it, they, they need to, you know, meddle around with it a bit more. And perhaps get some better telescopes to test it with. And you could always do with better telescopes. But like, what I like about this is, as you say, it's a new concept for the search for alien life. Now, we've spoken a bit on the show about the fungal network in the soil, the mycorrhizal network, mm -hmm. or the wood wide web, as uh, it's often called. Yeah. And Rowan, you've got an interesting take on that this week. Can you tell us a bit yeah, about that? Yeah. So, you know, as you say, we do talk about this quite a bit. And, and actually a bit like the multiverse, yeah. um, the concept of the wood wide web is something that's really taken off in the public imagination. Mm -hmm. And actually also like the multiverse, it's probably gone much further than scientists would um, would suggest that we, we should have done. Yeah, the claims for what the uh, mycorrhizal network can do, they're a bit overblown, right? Yeah. They, they said can. too much. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, what we do know is amazing enough. We know that there's this incredibly extensive underground network, uh, mycorrhizal network that grows in symbiosis with plant roots in the soil. And these fungal threads penetrate the roots of plants. They provide nutrients for the plants in return for sugars that the plant makes from mm. photosynthesis. Uh, it's incredibly complex. We're still learning how it works. But 
this week, what I wanted to, to draw attention to is uh, something that a musician and an artist called Brian D'Souza has made. What well, well, he's made mu- music from mushrooms. And to do that, he's used a process called biosonification, which means he's measured the electrical impulses uh, from different mushroom species <laughs> and then turned that into music. I think we've got to hear yeah, some of that. Some. Uh, this is from Shiitake Mushroom. And as I say, he's done other mushroom species as well. This is from reishi mushrooms. Let's hear that one. A bit gentler, isn't it? It's very different. Yeah. That first one sounded to me like they were all kind of screaming a little bit. But this one, much more relaxing. Yeah. I'll put a link to Brian's work in the show notes. Um, And if you're in London on April 19th, there's a live performance of this mushroom music. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. It's taking all my restraint to not say, is this fungi music? (laughs) Like funky, but it's it's too much, too much trying to force it. So I'm not going to put that in. (laughs) Is there some reason behind all of this, you know, beyond it just being fun? Or is is there something? I mean, uh, I think the... It's to emphasize our connectedness with nature, um, to emphasize our our part in nature, which, of course, we always need more of. Now, before we go, we wanted to mark the passing this week of Peter Higgs, who proposed a new particle known, of course, as the Higgs boson. He's died aged 94. Yeah, sad news. In 1964, he proposed the existence of a field that gives mass to other particles. And that has its own particle associated with it. This became known, of course, as the Higgs boson. And then after billions of dollars and the construction of the biggest scientific experiment ever made, the Large Hadron Collider, and the work of thousands of scientists, the particle was eventually discovered in 2012. And then Peter Higgs shared the Nobel Prize for it in 2013. Yeah, he was an absolute legend among particle physicists. And I just want to play a clip of him at CERN in 2012. This was when the discovery was made. So let's, uh, you know, you can hear his voice and his generosity in acknowledging the contribution of others. I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. Uh, For me, it's really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime it's taken (laughs) my favorite comment when his death was announced was someone on twitter saying uh, would there be a mass at the funeral (laughs) Um, did you have a favorite anecdote from peter higgs yeah I, i really remember fondly when the nobel prize had been announced and then there was this quite long gap where nobody could find where he was so the world knew but he did not yet know and there were rumors that he was maybe hiking in the scottish mountains it could be days before he was found and then some his neighbor just spotted him wandering in the street he'd come back from lunch uh, soup and trout in leaf famously and the neighbor saw him and sort of pulled over peter peter you've won the nobel prize and that's how he found out yeah um i have to admire his lack of mobile phone or even email yeah he didn't have incredible Let's play out with some more of the mushroom music. Thanks for listening, and thanks to our guests, Michael LePage, Carmela Padovich Callahan, and Corinne Wetzel. I'm Timothy Revel. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Do subscribe to our show on whatever platform you're listening to so you don't miss out, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye.
just imagine me as a hot dog. (laughs) (laughs) This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.